So welcome back everybody to our next session where we're going to hear from Maine about developing partnerships and, and doing outreach to access and get all this land and water conservation um, fund dollars on the ground. So we're going to hear from Andy Cutco. He's the director of Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands and he's also a newly designated member of the Outdoor Rec um, Network from Maine. He has a 30 year professional career, um, it includes uh, positions with uh, a forestry consultant with the US Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, Nature Serve, which is an international conservation group, uh, an engineering consulting firm, and the Maine Natural Areas Program. He's a licensed forester in Maine and past board chair of the Bodingham Community Development Initiative. And of course, he's an avid outdoorsman as so many of you are. Uh, we're also gonna hear from Doug Beck, He's the outdoor recreation supervisor in the grants and community recreation program where he manages Maine's land and water conservation fund, the recreational trails program and the Maine Conservation Corps. He came to this position in 2014 after five years as the physical activity coordinator at, at the Maine Center for Disease Control. And uh, prior to that position, he was the recreation superintendent for the city of Auburn and was the first executive director for the Maine Recreation and Parks Association. And we're also gonna hear from one of their partners, Carl Davis, who is the um, vice president of a three, uh, three Rivers Land Trust. He lives in Acton, Maine, and he taught forestry and conservation at a special education high school. He's done trail work and also he's a small scale farmer and he's a founding member of the Three Rivers, Rivers Land Trust, which was established in 2000. And he says that being outdoors and active defines him. So I want to turn it over to Andy and Doug and Carl. Great, uh, thank you very much, Bevan, and nice to see some uh, familiar faces and a few familiar names there. Uh, for those who haven't been to Maine, uh, I would say Maine is like the East Coast version of Colorado, except the skiing is cheaper, the beer is better, uh, and we have 3,000 miles of coastline. So um, take that, Colorado. Your video was awesome, but uh, we love Maine. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to... What's that? I said you'll need to send us a video for our next meeting. All right, excellent. Um, so what I'm going to do is just set the stage by talking briefly about outdoor recreation and the state park system and public land system here in Maine. I know we have uh, Carol Ann Willette, I believe, is on the call as well from Maine, um, and she can certainly chime in. And then I'm going to turn it over to Doug Beck for really the meat of the presentation, talking about land and water conservation and its application here in Maine. And he's going to highlight a couple specific projects, uh, one that Carl was involved in and another that I've been involved in where we're working with uh, local land trusts and, and partnership. And I think that will probably lead into a, a broader conversation about uh, partnership in Maine. So um, for those who haven't spent much time in Maine, outdoor recreation really is a, a growing and major part of our economy. Uh, report last fall ranked Maine third in the country in terms of the role that outdoor recreation plays in the overall economy. Uh, it pumped in nearly $3 billion into Maine in 2017. And in that report, we ranked only behind Hawaii and Montana. Uh, so I don't know if there's anyone from Hawaii or Montana on the call, but um, if so, we've got our sights on you. Um, and then just a reflection on, you know, the, the incredible year that, that just ended. Like everywhere, 2020 was just a remarkable year for outdoor use uh, in Maine. We set all-time records for both state park day use and state park camping. Uh, and that was despite various closures that were related to the pandemic. And, and I think what's, what's most heartening to me is that we saw, like a lot of states, um, we saw a lot of first-time users and uh, just many new families from Maine who are finding our, our state parks and recreation areas for the first time. And the Land and Water Conservation Fund is absolutely vital uh, to our outdoor recreation economy here. We have a a long history of funding projects at state parks and public lands and on local municipalities. Um, we're not quite to Pennsylvania's level, but we do have more than 800 projects across the state. And, and it was, you know, definitely the, the conversation about how you monitor all of those was uh, resonated with us. We have really less than one full-time staff person working on LWCF, so that's a major challenge. Uh, 
Um, but as a result of just the importance of the recreation economy here, we're really thrilled about the prospect of significant new funds coming in uh, from the Great American Outdoors Act. At the same time, we want to make sure that that federal money um, is wisely spent. And so the match requirement conversation also uh, resonated here as well, because we're, we're having, we've been having challenges uh, making sure that that match money is available. Um, so, so fortunately, uh, Maine is a, it's a relatively rural state, I guess, by Eastern standards, but the conservation and, and outdoor recreation communities are really tightly knit and intertwined. And as a result, um, nearly all the conservation projects happen uh, in Maine through partnerships, whether it's Land and Water Conservation Fund or Forest Legacy. Uh, the, the partnerships between the state and the nonprofits and uh, local municipalities is absolutely vital uh, to get projects done. And we have excellent, excellent representation here from uh, some of the national conservation groups like TPL, which has been mentioned a couple times on the call today, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, regional group, groups like the Appalachian Mountain Club, and then Maine is I think really somewhat unique as is uh, New England in that we have more than 80 local land trusts that are very active in, in local conservation here in the state. And you'll hear from uh, Carl about his work today. So uh, the couple case studies that we have to share today are, are in many ways, I think very typical of, of the collaborative type of conservation and outdoor recreation work uh, that's characteristic in Maine. So. Um, with that uh, introduction and, and context, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Beck. Well, thank you, Mr. Cutco. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here today. I hope uh, I'm really thankful, actually, that uh, my Nisorlo pals and Joel went first, uh, because this presentation you're about to enjoy um, is really a, a hybrid of one that I developed uh, as part of our promotional program when the uh, threat and promise of more funding uh, became a reality uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so I, I was able to delete all the, all the background about what the heck LWCF is and where does this money come from and all that good stuff. Um, so uh, we won't have to cover that, which is perfect. This will be much more focused. Um, uh, Lauren noted this with Pennsylvania, but uh, so I've been in this position for six years. Uh, when I came into the position, our uh, annual apportionment to the state of Maine was $487,000, give or take. Um, we typically, as a, as a uh, practice, earmark half of that to state level projects and half of that to local level projects. So when you're talking about uh, less than $300,000, uh, for each side, our, our total grant max um, was small. Uh, I think actually it was, uh, it might have been $50,000. Uh, and, and, it, and it was um, relatively easy to allocate those funds to a, to a project. Um, that's changed. Uh, that started to change three years ago uh, with the increase in GoMesa funding. And it's... Um, and the, the, the significance is that our last year's apportionment to the state of Maine was a, a bit over $2 million. Um, we've been increasing the amount that you could ask for funding uh, annually uh, to try and keep pace with that. One of the things that all of us are challenged to do on the state side is after 20 or more years of fighting for stateside funding to be equitable, uh, now that we've got it, uh, we, we want to be able to use it. And that's the challenge that we were faced in. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, how the heck are we going to get rid of all that money? Um, so what we did in Maine, and I, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, so the basic background, uh, while you're, while you're uh, perusing that again, uh, we started on a, a campaign to reach out to partners. Uh, partners such as the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, the Maine Land Trust Network, the Maine Recreation Park Association, Maine Association of Planners, Maine City and Town Managers Association, uh, everybody that has something to do with potential projects. Uh, you see here that we just received project number 891 uh, last spring. Uh, of those 891 projects in the state of Maine, easily two thirds are local project sponsors. 
our municipalities and school districts. So how do you get the information out to them about whether these projects, uh, how to tap into the money? Um, and again, uh, so we have, we have a project in every county and, and very much so all of the most well-known and most visited state parks uh, in Maine and many uh, municipal parks that, you know, when it comes to parks, interestingly, nobody cares who manages it. Uh, it, it depends on what the amenities are and whether it's close to them. Uh, so we have a lot of municipal parks that are on the par of state parks as well that people view uh, and are just overrun with folks, especially in this COVID world. Um, next slide. Basics of eligibility that were covered again uh, earlier, only government units. Um, uh, so speaking of that, tribal nations are eligible as well. I did a presentation to Maine's tribes this summer to also try to uh, throw the net as wide as we could for eligibility and, uh, and potential uh, project sponsors. Um, they have to be outdoor recreation facilities. Every project must have a recreation component. Every project must exist as a standalone recreation area or a park. So you, um, that's, that's an important distinction as we move forward and we'll probably touch on that later, but uh, we, can't fund, um, we can't fund part of a park or as we'll get back to the boundary uh, later, the, the, the result of any funding has to result in a standalone recreation area. Uh, so next slide, please. This, when you're talking with local project sponsors, um, is an important fact. Land and water investments are forever, perpetual. Forever is a long time. Uh, and, and, you know, the 6F boundaries and all the rules of the program uh, play into uh, that protection. But when you are a, an outside entity, hypothetically, approaching a potential local project sponsor, uh, there's a, the, the com combination of the previous presentation and this presentation, I think are gonna be very valuable because you really need to do, uh, enter into an education program where you're helping people understand what the program is and what the rather uh, robust strings attached are um, in order to get everybody to a stage where they appreciate and understand what they're getting into. Um, I worked for a long time in municipal parks and recreation. Uh, I know municipalities well. Uh, I have yet to, uh, uh, even in, in, in this part of my career, I've yet to come upon a municipality that doesn't want to get grant money to do something new. Um, I'm sure this will come as a surprise to all of you on this call, uh, but a lot of municipalities, um, once they've built something, aren't too keen on budgeting to take care of it. It's as if, it, you know, it's, takes care of itself. Um, and that's the biggest challenge where this forever comes in, is we really want to see a commitment from that local project sponsor that they have the capacity to take care of a project if it's going to be built. Next slide. So how do we get it done here in Maine? Um, in recent years, uh, over the past, well, so in my six years here, there's been a number of projects that have involved a very um, strong partnership and oftentimes uh, the, the primary uh, focus or the, the energy behind the project came from outside the municipality. Uh, and we're going to focus on two of those here. Uh, and the first is uh, uh, my friend Carl Davis with Three Rivers Land Trust. But we were talking about this presentation yesterday and, um, and, I, th and I think uh, he'll correct me because I'll probably be wrong. But the beginning of this project started in 2015, maybe even 2014, um, and and we're still going. So uh, I'll let I'll let Carl regale you all on his process and what it what it looked like from a nonprofit organization, land trust, trying to work with a local small town in Maine that had limited capacity and a state level program uh, that leveraged federal funds. A lot of moving parts in that. How did it happen? Carl, and the next slide, please. Uh, 
And I think Carl's here. And if you're talking, Carl, you have to unmute yourself. Let's see. Okay, hear me now? All right. Yeah. Okay, okay. How are we doing? Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a brief history of the town and, and the land trust, just to update you a little bit. Um, Acton is a small town. It's a, approximately 2,500 people. It's an hour and a half north of Boston, um, which does say a lot about our development pressure and uh, actually is probably what brought Three Rivers into existence back in 2000. Um, we were seeing a lot of our farmland, forest land and things uh, being bought up and developed and motivated a group of us to, to get started with some land trust conservation work. Um, the Goat Hill project, which is in Acton, uh, went up for sale, the land went up for sale. We'll go with 2015, Doug, I think that's close enough. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> Uh, went up for sale in 2015. Uh, the land trust had had this particular parcel as we have other parcels on our radar. Uh, went to speak to the landowner and told him, asked him if he was willing to work with us, telling him initially that this would at least be a two year um, endeavor for him and would he have the patience to deal with, with us. Um, he did agree to it. Uh, I think he had a little bit of conservation uh, in him. He really did enjoy the property. His family had run an apple orchard on it for probably 40, 40 or 50 years. Um, so he did have an attachment to it. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the first things the land trust did was we realized this was a little bigger project than we'd ever uh, challenged ourselves with and that we probably needed some outside help as we did not have any um, staff at that time. It was all volunteers. So we hired uh, Jerry Bly, who's a conservation land consultant, um, and worked with him. We divided the 250 acres up into approximately three parcels, two farmland parcels, and the 25-acre hilltop parcel, <clears throat> which is the one that we were had our eyes on that we would try to work with the town on. Um, so the first step was we had Doug come down and take a look at the project to see if it would fit with LWCF. Um, he felt it would and did encourage us to apply for the grant. The next step, which was gonna be the tough one, was to go to the town to try to get match. Uh, we needed 177,000 to buy the top of the hill, the 25 acres, as well as we needed money to develop a trail, which Doug suggested that we try to do an ADA compliant trail. Um, we went to the town and asked them for $100,000. The town had never, ever voted any money for conservation. Um, fortunately, the town got behind us and uh, approved the, the full $100,000. Um, so at that point, we felt confident to apply to LWCF. Um, Doug was good to work with us on the, the grant because we had never done one before. And of course, we're working with the town at this point too. Um, that's where the town entered in, uh, became a partner, um, agreed that this was a worthwhile project to, to work through. Um, so then we, we did get the grant in 2017, 18, yeah, 17. And as was pointed out earlier, the grants run for three years. Of course, we thought for sure would be done with the project in three years. Um, the acquisition went through fine. Uh, we got the parking lot in and then uh, got started on the trail and then uh, ran a little short of money uh, on the project. And Doug came down, took a look at it with us, which was great, and suggested that we hire a professional trail builder to bring the trail into ADA compliance, which was a very good suggestion. Um, we put that out to bid and, and got a fellow in there. And at this point, we're 95% done. Um, we had to apply for more funding with LWCF, LWCF as well as an extension of time because we went beyond the three years. Um, all of that takes time. It's, it's 
I mean, I'd say one thing with any, but it's with any of these projects, patience is, uh, is the key word. Um, but for our land trust, this partnership and this grant um, helped us tremendously with our exposure and relationship with the community and has moved our membership uh, along greatly and also our ability to fundraise. So it's, it was a, a game changer for us for Three Rivers Land Trust. I think uh, the next slide shows the, the relationship of the parcels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Carl, Carl's been the point person facilitating, you know, he's, he's been holding all, you know, juggling all the balls mm -hmm. up in the air uh, during the course of this uh, project, which uh, is on uh, the glide path, I'll say. To completion um, once uh, one, once winter's over here, um, but he's you know he's humble, and uh, and I think it's uh, it's important to know how instrumental Carl was in doing this. Um, I think Acton the the level of staffing for the town of Acton is a town clerk, uh, mm -hmm. right? So you know they have one full time employee in the municipality uh, whose job really is in managing acquisition development projects. Uh, it's running the town. Um, so Carl's kept this thing moving. Uh, you know, he's working with the town to make sure that all of the bills are paid by the town, helping them with the reimbursement documents, uh, doing a lot of the paperwork. But it, you know, so it's, it's really, it's very much a, uh, a mutualistic and very trusting partnership that has to be developed to uh, bring this project to fruition. Um, and, and I think interestingly, because Acton is in, uh, part of the state where there's, uh, increased development pressure, uh, and because it's, uh, reasonably proximate to where a large percentage of the population lives, uh, the, the, um, ABA, uh, accessible trail development is going to be, uh, once it's complete, this is going to be. A, uh, a mecca for families and be, you know so this is so an ABA trail is something that you could take your grandparents and and your toddlers all up on the same trail and they'll all be able to make it uh, so it doesn't mean while it's wheelchair uh, accessible uh, it's really accessible to the entire family and a much wider portion of the population um, and that's honestly that's a that's a good point relative to the land and water program because it's federal funding uh, the use of federal funds stipulates that um, there has to be accessibility uh, considerations now in outdoor recreation accessibility isn't always possible so it becomes a really interesting uh, part of the program in determining when accessibility is uh, should be part of the program and when it can't be and it's it's really an interesting uh, challenge. Uh, and I'll say, sadly, I, I expect that many of you will see the same thing. Sadly, most people think in terms of outdoor recreation, that ADA, ABA accessibility just can't happen. So the default for most people is uh, not going to happen. So part of the part of the challenge is to convince them otherwise. Any other uh, questions for Carl? Or any other points you want to make Carl before we move on? Well, you could show him the slide at the top of the hill. Uh, that's at the end of this. Uh, end oh, of it's the, at the end. Uh, okay. So we'll yeah. end with the beautiful oh, view. Yeah, I was going to ask Carl, what kind of information did the town need to justify this expenditure? Like, was this a hard sell to them? I mean, $100,000 can be, you know, pretty huge to a really small locality. Yeah, it was interesting. We had to go through, you know, public hearing process and things like that. Certainly had positive and negative um, feedback on it, but overall more positive certainly than negative. Um, I think I think the towns and as Doug pointed here in southern Maine, uh, I think they're realizing that it's it is important that we do conserve some land um, and I think they really like the ADA part of it. I think that was intriguing to them. I think it, they didn't believe it uh, to be honest with you. Um, 
but we're going to get there. And uh, I think for the town, they realize that it's going to be quite an asset um, for the surrounding communities. Yeah. I had, I had forgotten uh, that Jerry Bly was involved in this. So the yeah. common thread here, because Jerry was certainly a big player in our next project that we'll feature. So yeah. if we'll go to the next slide um, and we can talk about uh, Seven Lakes Alliance and uh, Bureau of Parks and Lands and Andy Cutco. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll touch on this one. This is um, a area that's about a half an hour west of Augusta, the capital area of, of Maine where I sit now. And so this is right smack in the heart of, of central Maine. And it's part of a large parcel of land uh, that's about 6,000 acres uh, plus of, of conserved land. Again, just a half an hour's drive or so west of Augusta. So it's really an important piece of recreational land that has trails for hiking, mountain biking, uh, ATVs, snowmobiles, etc. cetera. Um, and we'll show a map here in, in a minute or two, I think. But the, the piece that we're looking at uh, is a, a couple pieces that total about 800 acres and really are almost the key in holding right smack in the middle of, of the Kennebec Highlands. Um, this is an area that right from the get-go, uh, when, the, when the land was first conserved, the local land trust really took the lead and uh, recognized the, the local interest and desire in protecting this, this chunk of land at the same time recognized that as a land trust, they had very limited staff and capacity to manage and steward the lands. And so um, struck up a partnership with the state whereby the state uh, is the long-term owner and manager of the land, uh, but we do have a long-term uh, stewardship agreement with the Seven Lakes Alliance, where as, as uh, a local entity, they kind of keep tabs on the place and work on various um, trail uh, identification, maintenance, stewardship issues for us. And so they have really taken the lead in looking at this 800 acre uh, acquisition. And um, it's close to a million dollars. And you can see there what the, what the federal share is. And I think what the what one of the real benefits is, is we've all talked about how smaller rural communities are, are particularly challenged with coming up with the money for uh, land conservation projects is that uh, as a private nonprofit group, a, lo a land trust, whether it's a regional group like the Seven Lakes Alliance or a, almost a town-based group or a, a statewide group like uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, they have access to philanthropic money or basically, you know, wealthy donors um, that the town doesn't really have uh, access to or sort of a fundra fundraising mechanism to, to reach out to. So I think that's that's uh, one of the real benefits of, of working with the nonprofit community is simply access to uh, those other sources of funds that would be hard to come by in a, in a government situation, whether it's you know, federal, state, or local. Uh, so that's a quick summary of, of Seven Lakes Alliance in the Kennebec Highlands. Doug, I can't remember if you had a map. Next slide. Here. There we go. Yeah, so there it's in. The, the blue is the land that the state already holds. And the gray, which is a little hard to see, says Vienna Mountain parcel, close to 700 acres. And then there's a York Hill parcel, parcel at the Northwest. Um, so it really is a, um, a key parcel in maintaining the, both the recreation integrity and ecological integrity of this, uh, of this roughly 7,000 acre parcel. Um, and one of the interesting things about it in particular is, is that it's got, uh, it's actually, uh, partly forested and partly managed blueberry land. So uh, the top of the mountain is covered by managed blueberries and it affords incredible views of, of uh, the mountains of Maine and, and actually off to the White Mountains in New Hampshire to the west. Um, but also some interesting uh, and challenging questions about the uh, compatibility of recreation in terms of uh, trails and and hiking and scenic use um, and also active uh, blueberry management. And so we've had, we had a, a field trip out there last fall where we had probably 15 to 20 folks representing all of those interests and, and thinking about how to all work together to both um, acquire, but then successfully manage the land to really suit a lot of different interests. So I think that's, that's all I'll say on that project, Doug, and, and turn it back to you. Okay, 
And I think the next slide is a view of, yep, uh, the view of the top of the hill towards the Western mountains. Uh, most of those mountains are in Maine. There might be a New Hampshire one in there, but the, the best ones are Maine. <laughs> uh, so how does it all work? The, the, the rest of the presentation is really, um, and you can go, I hate to leave that slide, but it's, uh, we have to move on. Um, so the presentation is about, uh, this is essentially the same presentation to all of the non-government partners of how do you work with a municipality or local project sponsor to really take the lead on making a project a reality. And it's all about partnerships and relationships. Uh, and, and most of, and you know, you have to get the local project sponsor to a comfort level where um, they are willing to take on the project. You know, they're the ones that are gonna be responsible for this forever. Uh, they have to understand that. They have to uh, be cool with that. And uh, you have to get them to a point where they're uh, ready to do it. Next slide. Um, so this is all about kind of uh, the, the planning process. What do you want to do? Uh, does it qualify for funding? How much is it going to cost? Um, and, and do you have match? Match is, match is critical. Um, the, uh, how much is it going to cost is a really interesting question. Uh, of, oftentimes, um, an acquisition is easy to figure that out, uh, but not always. And um, more difficult is when it's just a development project. Uh, there's been a couple of projects um, in the mid coast region, actually, where a local donor has approached them. The, literally, the local donor walked into the town manager's office with a check for $300,000 and said, I want you to make this park better. Uh, the other was only $250,000. So clearly the person had preference, but that can happen. But you know, then it becomes, what, is, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? How much is it going to cost? Uh, next slide. This is key. Uh, the Park Service, uh, Joel will attest to this, uh, is really interested in projects that the public is in favor of. Um, there was a there was a really interesting project that was uh, proposed in the middle of the state, uh, which is not uh, you know the Augusta region. It's actually north of Bangor. Um, a wonderful project, a, a not a land trust, but an, actually it was the Atlantic Salmon Federation, was the the nonprofit external partner promoting this program. Um, there had been a, uh, a fish passage. Uh, project that had already existed, but there was some public land that they wanted to help the community um, develop for a park. So that um, it, 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 made, it made the whole package. Um, the only problem was, is that the idea was primarily that of the uh, Salmon Federation. Um, and when it came to, they did all the work, they put the grant together. Um, and I think I want to, uh, finish this story on the next slide, but who's doing it? Um, and this is the part that the local projects, uh, that that advocate for that project missed. So once they submitted the grants, they, again, this gets back to everybody wants the money to build something. Nobody, nobody wants to budget money to take care of something. So this particular town uh, was happy to have this other group do all the work on putting the grant together and apply for it, but um, nobody realized or paid attention to the fact that they had already received two land and water conservation fund uh, grants over the years. And both of those sites were in not really great shape. So the context of the grant application, when it got down to the part of saying, um, you know, are you committed to taking care of this? And everybody said, yes. And then we can look at the project uh, five-year inspections and say, well, how come you're not taking care of the ones you already are, have? Uh, so it's really important to know the whole story and get the town or the county or the school department to understand whether they have other land and water commitments already in their pocket. And if so, are they currently compliant? Because a non-compliant um, project, previous project will DQ 
any new application until compliance can be had. So it's really important to get that whole story down. Um, next slide. Uh, site visits are key. Um, it, it's really kind of the basis of a, of a site visit is, is very um, simple. Is physically, is this a good place for a park? Um, are, are the neighbors compatible? Is it going to create any problems? Is it going to be sympathetic with all the existing use? Is it a good site? And it's really basic. But I find these meetings are key because it's an opportunity to talk with the project sponsors and the people involved about um, what they're doing. What's, what's their vision? Have they talked to the community yet? Um, how are they gonna determine the costs of development? Uh, and this is where we always, I always talk to them about engaging some professional like a landscape architect uh, or other qualified design uh, and engineering firm for, for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that it can help determine, it can help the local project sponsor with that public visioning process, finding out what everybody wants and incorporating that into a plan. Um, even though there's more money coming down the pike, we don't want to spend it willy nilly. Uh, we want to spend it on projects that are, that are going to be wanted and used and are going to be a benefit to the local community. Um, the, the other benefit of hiring a professional landscape architect is that they'll be able to help you, not only help you create your vision for what the park should be, but they're gonna be able to uh, represent that vision in graphics that will make it easier for the grant evaluators to understand what you wanna do and what it might look like. And finally, uh, it's going to help um, you develop a budget that is adequate to result in the ends that you want. And one of uh, folks that don't do this, folks that don't follow this advice, um, this isn't 100%, but generally we'll end up with a budget that is either asking for way too much money to do what they wanna do or not nearly enough to do what they wanna do. Both of those are problematic. Um, so, and finally, the best part about this is that the Land and Water Conservation Program understands that good planning is part and parcel of a good project and the expenses incurred up to three years before receipt of a project agreement for design and engineering are eligible for use as match or reimbursement. So essentially, you know, if you're, you're spending 10 grand on a landscape architect to help you with the planning and design process, uh, you can get 5,000 of that back, uh, given the other five as match. Very important. And you end up with a much more competitive grant. You're much more likely to get funding if you followed that pre-application planning process. Hey, Doug, just a clarification in there. Um, the engineering match. So you said um, any expenses incurred up to three years for design engineering are eligible match. What if is it, is it eligible if the uh, services are donated? Can they put a price on that? Or do they? Uh, yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, there's been, um, there was another great project where this is a very small town in, in Northwest Maine mountains. Uh, they have no money. And it's kind of a retirement community. So uh, the, the, I posed the question, you know, you've got all kinds of people from all over the world that are coming here because of the recreation amenities. What are the chances that you've got a, a landscape architect or somebody similarly skilled in town? Town manager polled the community. Lo and behold, there was a landscape architect retired into the community and they donated all the services for development. And all they really needed to do then is what's the value of that work? So we had to have the landscape architect provide um, basically an invoice and then evidence that that would have been uh, the costs that they would normally have charged. So they would need some documentation to verify that value, but then that value is 100% uh, match eligible for the project. Good question. And those are, you know, that's that's really the benefit of uh, those are the exact kind of questions that come up in the site inspection. Uh, you know, what do you want to do? How are you going to do it? What are your opportunities? What are your resources? How can you leverage all of that to develop a local project that's going to be viable? and result in a good project at the end. Uh, next slide. 
at least for our project uh, application process, I try to develop a grant application that makes sense. Um, I have a guidance document that, that takes you, uh, can walk you through it step by step. Um, it's always surprising to me, really surprising to me, uh, after you've done all that work in developing an application and guidance, how people read it differently than how you intended it to be. So there's always an opportunity to uh, update it and change it. Um, the uh, documentation of the public process is important to uh, be able to give us and ultimately the National Park Service a good idea that this project is uh, desired. Now, uh, I know from personal experience having done it, it's fine to sit in your recreation department office and say, hey, this park needs some help. I'm going to create a, I'm going to write a grant. Um, the, and back in the day when there wasn't a lot of money, uh, you could get funding for that. Uh, and I did. And um, the reality is today, though, that uh, because of the increased funding, so this is a good part to talk about that. So we did kind of a dog and pony show. I called it a dog and pony show, um, but we did it. And uh, we were out talking to people uh, last year in anticipation of passage of the Great American Outdoor Act and more and permanent funding for land and water. We needed more applications. Um, be careful what you wish for. The, uh, prior to this year, and this is really remarkable in the context of the COVID-19 and uh, everybody, um, uh, you know, reduced municipal budgets, reduced state budgets, everybody has less money. I never would have thought this. Ordinarily, I would have gotten um, a request for 20 to 30 pre-approval site inspections. Uh, this year, I would have expected that to have been half. Uh, surprise, it was more than double. Uh, so I've had over 56 requests for pre-approval site inspections for a total request of over $12.5 million worth of federal funding, which equates to uh, proposed projects in excess of $25 million uh, for the state of Maine. Remarkable, remarkable. And I can't, I, I only know of one of those communities that actually said that their interest in investing and reinvesting in their local park system was directly related to uh, the amount of use it was getting based on the COVID environment. Um, I suspect that they're not the only one, but they're the only one that ex has expressed that. Um, if it's, uh, Joel kind of touched on this, development and acquisition. Acquisition costs uh, upfront are not eligible for reimbursement yet. They might be, uh, but the, um, because of the use of the federal funds, the value of the land uh, has to be established via UASFLA, also known as Yellow Book Level Appraisal. Uh, you have to hire an appraiser that can do an appraisal at Yellow Book standard. You also have to hire a, an appraisal reviewer uh, to make sure that appraiser number one did the job to the standard of Yellow Book. Uh, and at least in Maine, uh, that, that's running about five to $6,000 uh, just for that appraisal. So there, are, you know, if like in, in um, you know, Carl's case with the acquisition costs, those, those are costs that the town or the land trust are gonna to have to bear on their own. There's no reimbursement for that and it, it isn't valuable for match. Um, let's see, the, and the 6F map, this is where we get to the forever part. Um, every project that receives land and water funding is going to have a map uh, developed that identifies the area benefiting uh, from the program and the area within that 6F boundary has to be maintained for public outdoor recreation forever. Um, so again, forever is a long time. So it's really important that this map contain everything uh, and that both the local project sponsor and the state liaison officer agree on those boundaries. The current standard is that uh, both of those, the so local CEO and uh, myself as an SLO will sign that map. Um, that, oh, that hasn't always been the case and every state has a legacy of projects that have uh, incomplete or 
ambiguous or maybe even non-existent maps, which is a compliance issue that uh, uh, we're, we're, we all deal with. Um, and I think I have an example of what a map might look like, at least to the extent that I can develop one. And this shows uh, on Swans Island uh, off the coast of Maine, they did a small playground project. I think it was um, the value of the project was in the $25,000 federal fund share. Uh, but you notice the small square is where the playground was, but you'll, the, the bigger black line is the boundary of the park that benefited from the funding. And that's the area that then has to be maintained for public outdoor recreation forever. Um, so it's an important, this is a very important part of the, of the program uh, and something that upfront everybody has to agree on because in a hundred years, uh, everybody involved in this program is not gonna be here, but that park's still gonna be there. And in a hundred years, my guess is that waterfront property on Swans Island in Maine is going to be primo, and somebody might come along and want to build a big resort there. Uh, and if the town sells it, the town has to find land that is equal to or greater in value from that boundary at that time that that's no longer a park, and they have to find land on the island that is not in recreation, that is equal to or greater in value. Uh, they have to buy that and develop a new park. And just real quickly, the uh, that, that can be dramatic. There's a community in Southern Maine that had a $36,000 grant uh, for some playground and field uh, improvements. That park that was captured within the 6F boundary included 19 acres. This was associated with the school. Uh, the school was sold, the town forgot about or didn't realize they had encumbrances on the property. Um, 25 years after the grant, that $36,000 investment cost the town $1.2 million because that was the current appraised value of the land captured in that 19 acre boundary. So that's, that's a lot more than $36,000. Uh, so there's some, that's, those, are the, those are the big strings attached. Uh, next slide. I think this is the last slide in the view from the top of Goat Hill. No, no goats in sight. No. <laughs> so in closing, the, there are, again, I mentioned that, you know, sometimes you have a uh, local donor just walk through the door and give you, you know, put a check on your table. Uh, more often, it's a project like Andy and Carl described, uh, where there's multiple partners, a lot of moving parts, and it ha you have to have open communications the whole time. Um, and, and there's a wide range of opportunities out there. Of the 56 plus uh, pre-approval site inspections that I'm uh, working through this year for spring application, uh, at least eight of them are, are being spearheaded by nonprofits, NGOs, uh, who are uh, engaged in that relationship development with their local community. So, uh, and I think now's a good time to just open the floor to questions or how we can help. Sure, and I'm just gonna invite the um, network uh, members just to, you know, put your video on and unmute yourself and ask questions. So Doug, I'll, I'll start out. So um, the way the Land and Water Conservation Fund dollars work, which I thought I understood or heard in the last presentation, and anybody else can jump in on this, was um, that you don't get upfront dollars, you, did you get reimbursed for the yeah, work? That's a, that's a really important distinction. This is a reimbursement yeah. grant. Okay. It's, it's even as often as you tell people, it's surprising how many times uh, You'll get to the all right. Here's your project agreement. And they say, "All right, when do we get our money?" I'm like, "What? You get your money after you spend the money that you said you had. So start spending money." Okay, so oh, those so they have to start spending their match. They have to. Well, so um, think of it this way, um, and this is important at least in Maine for the municipalities. Uh, so the municipality has to have the authorization. So for let's just use whole numbers. If the project is getting $100,000 in federal funding, uh, that means the project is at least $200,000 in total value. The town has to have the authority to spend at least $200,000 because ultimately they do have to spend at least $200,000 in order to get reimbursed for $100,000. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And, and you can't get, and you have to get your will, better said, you will only get reimbursement for cash outlay. So you, you won't get reimbursed for the value of donated goods and materials. Okay, right. Um, but a lot of your match can be made up in the form of uh, donated goods and services. Mm -hmm. So towns often have public works departments. Uh, the value of their time and big equipment on the project uh, can can make um, can make up a lot of match. But um, at least half of your project has to be cash outlay. Otherwise, you won't get that value back. Mm -hmm. And that was just a question we got in the chat as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so members of the network, you can just, um, you know, pop on your video and, and take yourself off mute and hop in and ask some questions. It could not have been that comprehensive of a presentation. So maybe I'll ask Andy this. So I, um, I, when, when I was talking to Doug, or I think I was talking to Doug from Nasorlo, um, he said that the, the, the um, land trust organizations and maybe the national ones weren't as involved in the, in the prior years because the money, you know, there just wasn't that much money there for them to get involved. And, and maybe they are getting more interested now again. Uh, have you found that in your state? I think we had some of that discussion yesterday is that with the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act and, and significantly more funding available, um, it, it, uh, it is enough to leverage the work and effort and activity of, of groups like uh, TPL. Um, but, it, you know, my, my experience is that they're really, um, they're sort of scattered in terms of where they have a, have a strong presence and, and Groups like the Nature Conservancy have had a strong presence in Maine for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, TPL has sort of ebbed and flowed, and we just happen to have a really um, energetic and and uh, an engaged TPL person in Maine right now, um, who's very interested in in the idea of community forests, uh, creating spaces for you know open space for recreation, and even in some cases timber harvesting for local communities. So. Um, she has jumped right in and offered to, to sort of play this role of, of a, you know, a Carl or, or a Jerry Bly or someone who's, who's an intermediary, um, both at, at looking, up, looking at negotiating specific projects in Maine, but also helping us with this much bigger question of, of match. And, um, you know, the, the nice thing about national level groups is she's got contacts in all the other states. So um, we started developing just really good brainstorming calls of, of how that match component is being developed in, in states across the country. And, you know, there's everything from real estate transfer taxes to taxes on outdoor recreation equipment to um, we've had some interesting conversations lately about uh, energy mitigation money as, you know, solar and wind development take off in Maine. Um, are there ways that that uh, money can be directed from uh, mitigation funds to, to land conservation? So I think that's one of the real assets of, of these national conservation groups is, is the both the, the sense of what's happening all across the, the nation, as well as um, like many of you have, you know, con contacts in, uh, in D.C. Yeah, that's great, Andy. Um, I, I should do a plug for our survey because we were surveying um, the state offices to figure out what what they're using as grants and which which states did have some dedicated uh, funding for you know for land conservation or recreation that could be used as matches. So we'll have to hook up with you and TPL to see. You know, I know OIA did a report on that and and had surveyed some states, so there was some information there. We're gonna have to you know, check it out and. And work with the Sorlo on that as well. Um, I would, I would uh, coincidentally, I just received today an email from uh, folks with the Land Trust Network in Maine that they have a major donor who is interested in helping make up land and water match. So it's, it's very mysterious right now, uh, but the awareness of the need mm -hmm. has generated those kinds of opportunities here, mm -hmm. where now we just have to look at what are their particular interests? Do we have any projects in the wing? 
uh, I think, uh, you know, Lauren mentioned before that, um, and we do this typically, you know, so it's a two stage application, first to the state uh, for your state side approval. And then if everything's ready to go, it goes to the uh, park service for park service approval and development of the project agreement. Mm -hmm. Very frequently, we have grants that are very fundable. We have applications, good mm -hmm. projects, very fundable, but they don't have match yet. So we'll approve them tentatively, uh, but I won't submit it to the Park Service until they've verified mm -hmm. with me that they're really shovel ready, that they have match. So in this particular case, it's very exciting because if I compare, I do have several that are kind of waiting for match. If, if that aligns with this individual donors, then we can fast track those grants. Or if we have projects that are that are going to be applied for this spring, um, then we can match that donor with those projects and those municipals, municipalities, and give them, you know, give them a step up. So it's, it's Doug, how did you how did you let people know that they could submit an application without match? Because I mean, I'm you know, just the way I think is like I wouldn't even submit an application if I didn't have a match. So how do you let people know like Hey, if you don't have a match, submit an application. We might be able to find something for you. Well, in ours, that's that's where it comes to the guidance. So if they read the mm -hmm. guidance, they'll understand that um, the the more match they have at the time of application, mm -hmm. uh, the more likely they are to be awarded a grant and kind of fast track to the next next opportunity for National Park Service review. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a scale, but in our world, uh, it's uncommon for a municipality to have it right now. Um, and frequently, um, frustratingly, but frequently, uh, they'll apply for land and water funding to help leverage the development of MATCH. So they'll want, they'll want the preliminary approval for me for their grant to then go out and shop the project around and say, hey, you know, help us get to the point where we can get this project going. So it's, um, it's a reality. It's, it's, uh, so there, so we don't say don't apply if you don't have match. We say the more match you have, the more likely you are to get funding. If you don't have match, you're going to go into this holding bucket. And when mm -hmm. you get match, let us know. But if it's a good project, we'll award it. When you get matched, then, then we'll go to the next level. Um, Bevan, I, I should point out, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, not every state is like that. And, and the, the, mm -hmm. each state varies. And uh, some are very conservative with their program and they're not nearly as flexible as what mm -hmm. has been described. So we'd like to have everybody as flexible as, as Maine, but they're not all, <clears throat> all like that. Just wanted you to know. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, that's something good for our members to think about and talk to their um, your fund administrators about to see if they offer that kind of flexibility. Um, there was one last question I want to get in here before um, we turn to our next session. Um, uh, a question that says, do you think it's possible to work to eliminate the match for BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities, or establishing state or private funding sources dedicated to match for those communities? So do you all know of any state um, or private um, funds that are matching specifically for those communities. And um, I think there was some other comment about uh, the Oregon CARES Fund had ran into some uh, complexity with tying funding to racial demographics. So two minutes. <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm not sure that Maine, no, I'm not sure that Maine has, has um, a lot to offer in that. So I'd, I'd, uh, I'd open it up to the crowd as a whole. This is Lauren, and I apologize for the dog barking, um, but I uh, was going to say I'm not aware of anybody, um, a, a program specifically like that. I had mentioned we were looking at matching some of our state money with the federal money um, for some of the more underserved communities, communities that would have a harder time getting match. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, as we talked about in our presentation um, earlier, looking for a bunch of partners to to set up funds like that, you know, certainly could could happen. Um, it's an interesting, intriguing idea. Um, but we'd still have to stick with the 50% funding coming from whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, 
LWCF can only be 50% no matter what, because that's the in the law, so. You know, I come to this, Alicia, um, REI after time at Farm Aid, where I was working with a lot of food and ag communities. And I, I'm frantically reaching out to some folks because I, I thought I recalled some work um, to really change the match requirements for BIPOC communities. And I don't know if that was legislative. Um, I suppose it would have to be as opposed to rulemaking. Um, but uh, and obviously that's different than how things are implemented at the state, but I think it's something for us to right. have on the radar because it's a significant barrier for communities. Yeah. And if you um, find an example, Alicia, just please be in touch. You know, you're one of our sponsors, so we are in yeah. touch. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly that's a national moment where a lot of people are looking at that and Legisl you know, legislators are all heading into session and trying to figure out what they can do. So it'd be great to have an example to share with our with our members and they could share with their states.